Welcome to our introduction to accounting. My name is Professor Larry Louie, and I will be guiding you through this video, which will precede some work we do together in the classroom. So accounting and financial reports are the language and scorecard for business. You cannot really conduct business effectively without being able to read and understand financial statements. It would be kind of like this guy. You know, do you want to be the one on the left where you can see everything around you or the one on the right trying to run a business with blinders on? Obviously, we want to get rid of those blinders. Our goal for all health graduate students is to have financial literacy. This may mean slightly different things for the different programs, but generally we want all health students to have these particular capabilities. First, to analyze and interpret financial statements. Second, to assess the profitability and financial health of a company. Third is to have a basic understanding of the financial markets and institutions. And next, how to make financial decisions using financial data. And finally, how to create and use budgets to manage our business. The introduction to accounting in this video will cover these topics. First, what are financial statements? Why bother? Next is to look at the regulatory oversight, reporting requirements, and standards that oversee accounting for all companies. And then describe what GAAP is, generally accepted accounting principles. Then look at how those come together, these principles come together, to create a framework for reporting, and they lead to four basic financial statements. Then we're going to do an example. We're going to use Apple as an example, a company we all know, and show how that eventually becomes their annual report. Then in a separate exercise, we'll look at the accounting processes. Essentially, how does accounting work? Get underneath the hood, if you will, and see how do we go from a stack of papers and find which ones are transactions that need to be recorded, and then go about in a systematic way with accounting rules, organize that data to generate these four financial statements. So we're gonna go through all of that in these videos. First, what does accounting do? Well, first, it's a scorecard to measure, basically, performance and financial health. Well, what do we mean by performance? It is, what is our sales growth? How much do we have in sales? And how about profitability? How much profit do we make, and is it growing or declining in recent years? Also, measures of profitability. For every dollar of sales, how much actually ends up at the bottom being profit? Or if we look at assets, how many assets do we have in order to generate this amount of profit? And is it worth it? Is the return on investment sufficient to make it worth all those assets to generate this paltry profit? Hopefully it's not a lot of assets and not a paltry profit. On the other side, we have financial health. And this is looking at, is the company financially secure? Is there a bankruptcy risk where they can't pay their bills? And then the creditors put them into bankruptcy, which may jeopardize the continuation of the firm. And then do we have adequate resources to grow the business? We may have a great business, but without resources like assets and cash, we'll be stuck at our current level of sales. Well, can we build enough of a balance sheet in order to have resources to grow the company? Why do people care? Now, here are eight examples. There are more than eight, of course, but there are shareholders, lenders, suppliers, customers, employees, government, community, and society. You say, well, they're all very different. They have different interests, different self-interests, if you will. Well, how does accounting address the needs of all eight of them? Answer, a shareholder may be interested in making money by buying stock and seeing the stock price go up or buying stock and getting dividend payments every quarter from the company. A lender cares because they lent money and they want their money back and interest. Suppliers care because they sold the company some goods and they gave the company time to pay them. What if the company took their goods and didn't pay them? So we want to make sure that the companies that suppliers sell to are credit worthy. What if you're a customer? Well, we want to make sure that if we buy products and services from a company, that they're going to be around to support what we bought and to grow and enhance our use of their products over time. How about employees? Well, that one's easy. We want to make sure we get paid and that we can see promotions and job growth as we invest our time in the business. How about government? Well, the easy one is taxes. They get income taxes, property taxes, employee taxes, all kinds of taxes. Where do they get the data? They get data from financial statements. And jobs, of course, the, the objective for state, local, federal levels of government are all to create meaningful jobs that pay well, 
to their citizens and the community in which you operate. They want to look at jobs, but also the involve, involvement in philanthropy or just supporting what the community does in order to make it a great place to live. And finally, about society at large. Well, we want to make sure that the company's behavior is sustainable and responsible. These are harder to see in financial statements and one of the areas I'm most interested in, which is how do we expand the scope of financial reporting to capture other aspects of management, things like ethics, sustainability, and governance. And these are all important items that fall into a trend that we see in reporting and in investment behavior. Regulatory side is quite important because although we'd like people to do things voluntarily, they don't. So we have regulations. So there is a re regulatory body that oversees securities markets. And those are most important because you're taking money from people that don't know much about your company. And what if you steal the money from them? How do you know that the investment you make in the stock of a company isn't a sham or isn't one where you had partial information that if you had known better, you would not have invested? So there is a very structured set of regulatory bodies and procedures to make sure that the unsuspecting public can rely on statements and the process of securities markets to be able to invest their money into the, the future capital um, markets that will provide money from people that have money, like savers and investors, to companies that need money, like corporations. In the United States, that regulatory body is the Securities and Exchange Commission, and we call it SEC. And that's been around since the Great Depression in the 1930s, when there was widespread fraud and a lot of people lost money due to unscrupulous practices of corporations. So SEC started, and they've been on the run ever since, trying to stay ahead of people that are a little bit too loose with their words to try to induce some, some behavior that's not warranted. And there's no global regulatory body. They try to communicate and coordinate, but each country has their own set of regulatory uh, bodies and regulations. In China, they have the Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission. In Germany, they have the Federal Financial Service Authority. In the UK, they have Financial Service Authority. In France, they have the, the Autorité des Marchés Financiers. In Japan, we have the Financial Services Agency. So we see that just the smattering of selections here of five countries in addition to the US, every country has their own regulatory authority and rules. And they coordinate, but they're not identical. There's a reason to coordinate, a very good reason, because we want the capital flow, investment dollars to go from country to country. So we create a global market for companies' stocks and companies' bonds. And therefore, there's a lot of shared interests in financial markets. And we'll see this all the time, whether that's in accounting rules or in the operations of financial markets and institutions. Let's look at the regulatory requirements. Who gets what when? Well, first, let's look at shareholders. Shareholders are required to get fully audited statements once a year. That's by virtue of their stock ownership papers, sometimes called the stock subscription agreement. It's a contract between the company and its owners. Next, we have the regulators, as mentioned, the SEC in the United States. They're required to have all kinds of reporting, but at a minimum, an annual comprehensive report in a very specific format. We'll look at that standard format later on in this video. The next would be bankers and other business partners. And these are also stakeholders, right? Because they have either loaned or done business with the company and they wanna see some statements also. So depending on the contract, they may have access to different levels of information from the company. Bankers certainly would require uh, regular reporting so they could see how the company is doing because they have a lot riding on the company doing well. The reporting standards get a little tricky. In the United States, we have the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is a group that looks over the profession of accounting. And they create what we call generally accepted accounting principles shorthand gap and these are used in the United States but there's a movement to make those converge with the standards from the rest of the world called the IFRS as promulgated by the IAS, IASB. So we have a standard US that is set by the profession which is also adopted by the SEC but there's a movement to try to make that more uniform as we go from US to other countries. So 
the IASB again, International Accounting Standards Boards, sets the rules for a global set of standards. These standards are called IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. Right now, there are over 140 jurisdictions around the world that use the IFRS, including the EU, notably. If we look at a map of the world, and here we see it color-coded, that most of the world in blue have adopted IFRS. Then we have some, some countries that have not adopted IFRS, but are moving toward that. It's moving at a very, very slow pace, but at least they've had a stated objective of conforming the rules in their countries with IFRS. So there's a bit of negotiating going on. Then there are parts of the world, you see notably a lot of the continent of Africa have not yet adopted IFRS and have not begun conversion.